that I have come to love as a brother, as a friend, as a leader, as a minister. I guarantee most of you in here will know his name. Most of you in here will know him. He is the pastor and lead minister at Agape Family Worship Center. Born right here, he's right here in the Cayman Islands. So I want you to get on your feet and I want you to give this great man the biggest Cayman round of applause in just a moment. Everybody on your feet. This man is our crusade chairman. He is a man that walks in humility. He is a man that preaches the word. And when he preaches the word, people are touched. I have been touched by his ministry. And I know for a fact that somebody in here, many of you in here, are going to be changed tonight. Can we give the biggest round of applause for Pastor Andrew Ebanks? He's worthy in this place tonight. Come on. And you really believe that with all your heart that Jesus is worthy, not me. Jesus is worthy. Come on. Make some noise for him tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy in this place. And we worship and exalt you tonight. We lift up your name in this place. And we say, Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Hallelujah, Jesus. So we're going to shout Jesus one more time. And when we shout Jesus, I want Him to hear it all the way and give Him breath, all right? You ready? On the count of three. One. Are you ready? I don't believe you. Two. Are you ready? Yes. Three. Let's shout Jesus. Jesus! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God is worthy tonight. He is worthy to be praised. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. It is my privilege and honor tonight to be the speaker here this evening. As, uh, as my brother Jacob said, I am Pastor Andrew Ebanks, I'm the lead pastor of the Agape Family Worship Center, but I'm also the chairman of the Ignite the Fire Crusade. And I just want to say how blessed I have been the last three nights, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and tonight yet again. And God has just been doing some amazing things here. And so I just want to give him the honor and the glory tonight before we do anything else. Amen. Can we just give him a round of applause? Jesus has been working. People have been saved. People have been healed. It has been phenomenal. And we just give God praise and thanks tonight. We're going to uh, be looking at the word here. But before I begin, I just want to give honor to our director, Alexander Worm, and his lovely wife, Candace. Would you mind just standing for me, please? Give him a round of applause. Jacob and his wife Alicia, who are born uh, backstage, but uh, thank you to them and Michael Seth and his wife Michelle. We thank God for them and all the evangelists uh, who are, have come to the island and have been working here and preaching the gospel. Some of you are here tonight because of them, and we give God thanks for the work that they have been doing on the ground in the Cayman Islands. It has just been absolutely phenomenal to see the lives that have been touched and changed by Jesus since they have been there. I also want to just honor tonight our premier, the Honorable Juliano O'Connor Connolly. It's such a privilege to have you here with us tonight. Give a big round of applause. I don't know how many of you know this, but it's rare around the world to hold an event like this one and have the leader of your country be there. And it's phenomenal to have you here with us tonight. God bless you so much and thank you for coming. I don't know if I'm missing anybody else here, but if you are, please, if I am, please forgive me. God bless you all. God bless you all. So, first of all, happy Cayman Thanksgiving weekend. It is happy Cayman Thanksgiving weekend. And, and what a privilege it is to be at Ignite the Fire to celebrate the heritage that we have in Christ as a nation uh, in, in the Cayman Islands of what God is doing here as a people who from our inception have sought to honor God with our lives. And that is what we're doing here tonight. 
And you know, it was funny on Wednesday night we were we were coming here, and, and, and when we were getting ready to come, uh, my, I kept saying, "We're going to ignite the fire tonight." And my kids who were with me, my son kept looking at me, and he kept asking me these strange questions. He said, he "said Dad, where are the marshmallows?" I said, um, "We don't have any marshmallows." Oh man! And then a few minutes later, he comes back. He says, "Dad, where's the hot dogs?" I, I said, "For what, son?" And he eventually, he walks away and he comes back and he kind of stumbles off, uh, kind of upset. He comes back and he said, Dad, are they going to have s'mores there at least? <laughs> and I went, son, we're going to the Ignite the Fire Crusade, not a bonfire. <laughs> and when he, he's like, oh, okay, okay, Dad, okay. And so I, I thank God we're not having a bonfire here tonight, but we're having to ignite the fire here tonight. When Jesus is igniting the fire here in these hours in our lives. So tonight I want to speak to two groups of people. I want to speak to two groups of us tonight that the two groups kind of encompass a lot of smaller groups within them. But the first group I want to talk to tonight are the church. Those of you who are a part of the local church here in the Cayman Islands. You know, I, I honor everyone who's come from far away, and, and I'm eternally thankful for them who have, have come from overseas to be here with us tonight. But, but I want to thank our local pastors. Can we just give a big round of applause to our local pastors who have come on board with this Ignite the Fire Crusade, who have given of their time, they've, they've given of their, their, their efforts, they've given, uh, many of you come from different churches, and I just want to honor the pastors and local church here tonight and give God some glory for that. Because in a lot of places, you couldn't get this mix of people together to do anything. But we are here tonight in unity in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody needs to give God some praise for that. That's what this is about tonight. Because even though we come from different churches that may have some differences in them, and, and even though we may have different backgrounds and certain different beliefs about certain different things, to be here tonight with the cross-section of people that are here, that is something that is an answer to prayer. And you know whose prayer it answers? Jesus's. Just read John chapter 17. That's Jesus's prayer for us as his people, that, that we would be one, that we would be united as his people. And that's been our heart in this process because the devil fears a united church. Come on, somebody. He fears a united church because when the people of God get together and we say, you know what? Enough is enough, devil. We, we're sick and tired of you having your way. We want God to reign and rule. All of a sudden, he starts to quake in his boots, not because of us, but because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is Jesus who is with us. And when we come up against the enemy, we need not fear. We need not be dismayed because Jesus has already won the victory. He has already won the victory on our behalf. And we give God thanks for that tonight. But I want to challenge us as the church to not just get excited about the progress that's happening, about the things that are happening, about the event that is happening over this weekend. All these things are fantastic. But as the church, each of us needs to determine in our heart as individuals who represent the body of Christ to continue this work. Otherwise, it just becomes a good event that some wonderful people from overseas came and helped us pull off. If we as the church don't catch the fire, if we as the church in the Cayman Islands don't take up this mantle of evangelism, if we as the church in the Cayman Islands don't take up what God has called us to do, then what is going to happen is, is that when we hold these events, when, however often we hold them, we'll come together and say, man, that was a great event. But guess what? Until November next year or whenever it is we do another one, we'll keep walking around going, man, I wonder what happened. Ignite was so good last year. Why is it that all of a sudden everything just seems to have gone back to normal? I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to normal. Oh, this needs to become a normal. We need to become the church that Jesus Christ has called us to be. We need to be about our Father's business and telling the Cayman Islands and by extension the world that there is a Savior who died on the cross for their sins and that they can be forgiven and that there is hope and salvation for them. That's who we need to be. That's what we represent. 
That's what Ignite the Fire is about. Because for a lot of us, we're saying, oh, we need revival. Do you know what revival means? If you're praying for revival, the first thing you have to admit is that I'm a dead Christian. Let me just offend you for a minute and love you at the same time. Because you cannot revive what is already alive. You can only revive what is dead. And if we're praying for revival, it's because we're admitting that something is dead right now that God needs to bring back to life. That's what we're admitting. And so as I talk to the church tonight, y'all are just a very small part of my sermon tonight. But I want you all to hear my heart as one of the, the, the sons of the soil, as one of the pastors in this community, as one of the, the, the young men of the Cayman Islands. This is where my family has lived for generations. This is where my wife and children currently live with me and where we are raising our kids and, and the, the things of God are happening. My ministry is here. This is where God has called us to. And the reality of it is, is that if you are living in these islands, this is where God has called you to. That doesn't mean that you can't go to other places and travel to other places and preach the gospel there. Amen. But we must first tell the gospel where we live and then go to other places and tell them. Because what's the point of starting revival somewhere else when your own home is dying and needs Jesus? But that doesn't stop us from needing to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue. To every person who needs the gospel because every person, I, I like to say it this way in our church, everyone needs Jesus. No one is better without Jesus and nothing is better without Jesus. We all need him. Every single one of us. And so we don't ever want to lose sight of that. These islands need revival and we need to continue the work that has begun here not just tonight, not just the last two nights, but it has been happening over the last several months. And the things that, that, that as we leave this place, that we take with us, we carry it with us wherever we go. We are carriers of the flame. We are carriers of the fire that God is starting and igniting in this nation. Amen? Amen. All right. So, I want to talk now to the second group tonight. And the second group that I want to speak to tonight are those of you who God feels foreign to you. Those of you who this, an event like this, maybe you, you showed up here reluctantly tonight. Thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Maybe you came tonight not expecting anything or not expecting much. Maybe you came here tonight feeling like, like God is somewhat ethereal and distant and far from you. And you're wondering, how in the world, why in the world am I even at this event? Well, thank God you are. Amen. We're thankful that you're here tonight. We were on the radio just a few weeks ago, and I, and I said to people, I said on the radio, I said, if your expectation is for this event to fall flat, then come and watch it fall flat. <laughs> because we're happy for you to come. Because we know when you get here, you will be in the presence of God. We know that when you get here that, that Jesus is going to show up. Why? Because Jesus loves to meet with us where we gather. And, and as we talk tonight, I want to talk to you because you may have even tried this Christianity thing. You may have even for, for a while said, hey, I, I was a Christian. I, I used to believe all the things the Bible said. I used to walk with God. But, but for some reason, you know, it just didn't seem to work for me. It seemed like it was a lot more hassle than it was really worth. It, for me, I, I really struggled to really walk with God. I really, I really struggled to, to believe in God that, that it was a good thing for me. And, and I kept messing it up every time. I'd go to church, I'd lay at the altar, and I'd be at the altar, and I'm at the altar bawling my eyes out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus would come and touch me. And I'd be saved and hallelujah, give God thanks, yes. I love the Lord Jesus, and, and Sunday church is over. We go home, we have lunch. Monday comes around, and I felt like I was back to the same way. Oh, yeah. No matter where you fall tonight, whether this is you've never met Jesus at all, or you've met him, you've tried him, and it seemed like it didn't work, I'm speaking to you tonight. 
Because there's a choice that's available to you tonight. One that can change the direction of your life, not for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 years, however long you live. But a choice that can change your life for eternity. Amen. A choice that can change your life forever. I want to share a little bit of my story with you tonight. A lot of you know me, a lot of you don't. And a lot of you that think you know me don't know me. <laughs> because I am a pastor's kid. My father, many of you knew him, Pastor Ali Bites, amazing man of God, well-loved and well-liked in this community. And he and my mother raised me and my siblings well. I am the youngest of four kids. I'm 30, 34, 34 years old. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second. I'm about to be 35 years old next, in the beginning of the next year. But I grew up as a pastor's kid. I grew up in church. I grew up around all the things of God. I grew up hearing good preaching. I, I could tell you things that were in the Bible. I, I knew good theology. I was taught and raised very well. As a matter of fact, I heard a pastor say one time, and I agree with his statement. He said, I didn't choose this life. This life chose me. And, and I agree with that. And it almost felt that way. Because in every service the church had, it didn't matter how late it went and how early it started, we were at church. That was the way it went. And I went through my life doing what we would like to call being raised right. And I had amazing parents. I can't say anything bad about my parents. I had amazing parents. They taught us well. But from one perspective, you look at me and you could think, You've been a Christian your whole life. You grew up in church. You know all this, this stuff. Your, pa your father was a pastor. You were raised the right way. So you, you, you've been a Christian your whole life. Some of us can look at it that way. Some of us feel that way, right? Like, like we were just born a Christian because we were born and raised in church. But from another perspective, from the perspective of the truth, regardless of what you think about any of those things, I can tell you my whole life, from birth until this day, I'm a mess. I can't speak for anybody else, but I'm a mess. And I need Jesus just as much today Amen. as I ever needed him in my Amen. life. And that's the truth for all of us. There's never going to be a time in your life where you won't need Jesus. There's never going to be a day that you, you come to that they'll be like, man, I, I've, I've had enough Jesus in my life. That's not going to happen. We all need him and we need him desperately. You see, when I was 13 years old, life was good. Things were perfect. I had an amazing family. But on December 8, 2002, my life was absolutely rocked. My brother and I were in a car driving, went to pick my sister up from the airport. And on our way to the airport, our car skid out because the road was wet. And the car flipped. And when the car flipped, both my brother and I were inside the car and it tumbled across the road and then it went over and it landed upside down. And when it landed, I'm 13 years old, my brother is 17 years old. And he died and I lived. And when this happened, I was in shock. No way this, God, there's no way this could happen. Not to us, not to our family. My father is one of the greatest Christians I've ever met in my life. One of the most honest, God-fearing men I've ever known. My, my mother was an amazing woman of God. She, she played in church. She, she's been in church for, 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 from the time she was a little girl. They raised their children right. But God, why is it that my brother is not dead? And at the age of 13 years old, I began to wrestle with a lot of things in my own life because of what had happened to my brother. I began to wrestle with anger and bitterness and resentment 
I, I, I felt for a long time, I, I, I wanted to hate God. I don't know if any of you have ever been in that place, but, but I wanted to despise God. If there was a way that I could have found to have killed God, I would have done it myself. Because I was so angry. How dare you take my brother? How dare you touch his life? That's how I felt on the inside. And I hated God because I blamed him for what happened to me and what happened to my family. And as I grew, that anger and that bitterness grew with me. And, and, and for those of you who've known me for a long time, many of you know that, that, that I can be extremely quiet when I'm ready. Don't, don't, don't make all the noise fool you tonight. When I go home tonight, I'm, I'm going to curl up in bed. And I'm not, I, I don't sleep soundly, sorry. I snore, if you ask my wife, I snore like a freight train. I mean, it's just... <laughs> I call it sleeping and praying, but she calls it snoring. But, while I can be quite reserved and quiet, there was a storm that was brewing inside of me. A bitterness, an anger, a resentment. And it kept building up. And as, I, as that began to happen, as a young man, I, I remember being in church. I don't, know, I don't know if my parents ever found this out, but, but I remember being in church and, and cussing people out. I, I, I remember being so bitter and angry with God. I didn't care as long as my parents didn't find out. I, I, I was all right. And I was so upset. And I would walk around upset and angry and, and bitter at God. Not at anybody else but God. And I would think, God, how, how could you do this to us? Started getting into, involved in things and in relationships that I shouldn't have, people I shouldn't have been mixed up with, relationships I shouldn't have been in. And what began to happen is my life began to veer in another direction that was not the place that God had for me. I was running from Jesus. I was running from the Lord. It was not so much that I really hated God, I was afraid to surrender my life to God because of what had happened to my brother. I was afraid that, that, that if I really gave myself to God, if I really surrendered my life to Jesus, what would happen to me? What, what, what would become of my life? What would become of, of who I am? And you know one of the things I love about tonight and over the last several nights, it is, it's tonight we, 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 we marched around the walls of Jericho dancing and praising the Lord. And we, the last couple of nights we, we've been down here with positive dancing and having a good time and praising Jesus. And one of the things I was running from God from was, God, if I give my life to you, what a boring life I am going to live. God, I... My plan, let me, tell you, let me tell you Andrew's plan. Andrew's plan was I'm going to live to the right old age of somewhere between 80 and 100 years old. And when I was laying in Georgetown Hospital on my deathbed, I would cry out to God and say, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. And then that would be my last breath. And I would skirt through the gates of heaven and I would have been good. That was my plan. Until one day, a couple of years later, God showed up and he arrested me right where I was standing. He grabbed hold of my life. He took hold of me. And, and, and I had this encounter from God where I couldn't run. I wanted to run, but I couldn't run from God anymore. Where I couldn't turn away from him anymore. I had a choice. I could keep being angry. I could keep being bitter. I could turn and try to run away from God. Or I could surrender to Jesus. I could stop in that moment and say, Jesus, I give my life to you. And let me tell you something. No matter how you were raised, you could have been in church from the day you were born until this very day. I was raised right. But, but the reality of the situation is no matter how you raise your children, eventually your faith cannot be the faith of your parents. Your faith cannot be the faith of your grandparents. Your faith has to become 
your own faith. We all have to have our own faith. Jesus gives us this ability, this opportunity to have our own faith because we can't live off someone else's faith. We can't live off the faith. Uh, uh, you can't live off my faith tonight. And I can't live off yours. But I thank God that one of the gifts of the Spirit is faith. That the Bible says that he gives to each a measure of faith. Somebody say measure tonight. That to each one of us, whether you re realize it or not tonight, that to every single person in humanity, God gives just a touch, just a measure of faith, an opportunity to be able to believe yeah. in Him. And that's all you need because He said faith the size of a mustard seed could move mountains. And so then, what happened to me was I decided I'm going to give my life to Jesus. But like many of us tonight, I, I, I made a bad choice when I made that choice, you know. Not, not the choice to surrender my life to Jesus. The choice I made in that moment was, God, I'm going to work so I can show you how deserving I am of your salvation. What a bad choice. What a horrible choice. And I spent years of my life after this stuck in legalism, stuck in, in all these ideas and all these, these ways and all these things that I would do because I wanted to prove to God, God, I'm worthy of your salvation. God, I'm worthy of your love. God, I'm worthy of you saving me. Let me just do one more thing to show you how deserving I am of what you've done for me. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be a good Christian because I don't want to go to hell, God. I don't want to go to hell, and Lord, I want, to, I want to show you that I don't deserve hell. And I couldn't figure out why. I was miserable. It wasn't working. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. God, why, why is it that, that I've spent so many years chasing you and chasing things and, and doing the things that are supposed to be the Christian thing to do, the good thing to do, yet for whatever reason, God, I, I, I seem to keep coming up short in my faith that I'm absolutely miserable trying to serve God. I couldn't figure it out. <coughs> so I decided, God, I'm going to keep climbing the ladder. I decided, God, I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you. One way or another, I'm going to climb this ladder until I reach you, Lord. I, 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 and what I began to do, I began to work hard and keep going at it and keep going at it. And what happened that I didn't realize was that the mentality of this world, see, what this world teaches us is you got to hustle harder. What this world teaches you is you got to keep working at it until you succeed. What this world teaches you is that you've got to get rich or die trying. That's what this world teaches you. And if you don't have it, then you're a failure. If you don't have it, you're not successful. If you don't have it, then, 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 then there's something wrong with you. Just, just die alone. That's what the world shows us. That's what it teaches us. That's why so many of us today are so caught up in, in, in the rap race, just trying to get to the end, just trying to make it, just trying to do these things, and, and we're wondering why we're so miserable and we can't figure it out. That's how many of us try to relate to God. Like hamsters running on a wheel. We're running, we're running hard, we're running fast. But we're going nowhere. One day I was reading my Bible, going through all this. And I came across John 14, 16, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. And the life. Somebody, somebody say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, those are Jesus' words. That's what he said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said these verses. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I was spending so much of my time trying to get around Jesus. Jesus, how can I dodge you along the way? That's what I was trying to do. Jesus, let me, let me prove to you that I don't need you, Jesus. Let me just do it on my own. You don't have to make your own way tonight. 
Jesus has made it for you. He's made it for you. I want to, want to invite out one of our evangelists tonight, my good friend Ruben. Ruben, would you would you come? He's going to come out here and, and meet us here in just a second. And I want to show you something tonight about what many of us, where many of us find ourselves. See, many of us, this is us. We're standing here, we're, we're looking at this relationship that we've got with God, and we're like, you know what, all right, God, let me keep going. Let me, let me, let me climb a little higher, God. You know what, this ladder really isn't that tall. It, it, it doesn't go very far, does it? Yet, yet, I can't reach to heaven climbing this ladder. This is, it's a bit wimpy, isn't it? I need a bigger one. But you know what happens to so many of us is we're trying to get to heaven using this ladder. It's just a little bit taller than me. Look, look. As a matter of fact, I'm taller than it. Never mind. I, I, I'm trying to, to, this is what I'm trying to do. I, I'm trying to say, let me climb the ladder. Let me get to heaven. And, and it's a wimpy excuse for a try. It doesn't even get us to the clouds. It doesn't even get us out of this room. It doesn't, it doesn't help us get very far at all. And this is what we're doing when we're trying to make it in our own effort. We're saying, God, let me, let me show you how good I am, God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Look, I'm taller than all of you tonight. Jesus, I'm better than all those people down there. Because, look, they, they're just sitting down there and I'm sitting way up here. Look at how good I am, Jesus. Look at what I've done. I'm showing him all my effort and all my good work, but what really heaven is still quite far off. You see, what happens to us is that we're trying to climb the ladder, but, but we're not good enough, we're not tall enough to reach to where Jesus is. Not, not, not in heaven. Because that's where we, when we think about God, we think of God in heaven. We even pray it. Don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful prayer. It's a scriptural prayer. Our Father who are in heaven. Right? That's the, and that's where he is. And I'm trying to find my way up there to him. I'm trying to get to him. I'm trying to get to the throne room. But, but for some reason, the ladder's not tall enough. My effort isn't enough. I, I need a bigger one. And we can bring out ladder after ladder after ladder tonight. We can hustle harder and harder and harder. We can all work together tonight and even build a really, 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 really big one. But it still won't be enough. It still won't be sufficient. So what do we do then? If our efforts keep falling short, if it seems to keep falling apart and I can't save myself, when I can't save myself, what do I need? I need a savior. That's why Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone, say everyone. everyone. Come on, say everyone. everyone. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then you need to call him the savior, Jesus, because he's the one who can save you. He's the one who can rescue you. You can't save yourself. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how much effort you put in, no matter how, how hard and difficult the road is, and you come, you come over those obstacles and you go, oh, thank God. Look, look at what I did, Lord. Look at how good I am. Look, look at all my stripes and my scars. Look at what, what I've suffered for you, Jesus. I truly must be worthy because the Lord saves his hardest battles for his strongest warriors, doesn't he? But the choice is available to you today. And you may just not be aware of it. And you know what the choice you have today is? It's not to climb the ladder to get to Jesus. <laughs> this isn't what, what God's saying to you. What you need to realize is that Jesus is not way up there that you've got to climb the ladder. What you need to realize is that Jesus is right here standing next to you. You're not trying to get to Jesus tonight. You're not trying to climb up there to get to him. 
He's standing right here. Jesus doesn't, doesn't need to climb the ladder. You know why? Because he's right here with you all along. And you don't even have to take one step and then say, oh, thank you, Jesus. No, no. He's right here. Where I am. If you feel like you're in the valley tonight, if you feel like you're in the most difficult place of your life, can I tell you, Jesus is right here. If you feel like you're lost and you're hopeless, Jesus said, I'll leave everything. I'll leave the 99 just to find one. If we do this tonight and only one person is found, I won't be disappointed. You know why? Because that was the heart of Jesus. That if just one would call on the name of the Lord, that they would be saved. Because that's who he is. God came for you. You can't save yourself, but you know what? Jesus saves. Amen. He saves. So how do I get to God? You don't. Because God came for you. John 3, 16 and 17. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. And then verse 17, we often miss this verse, but I want to read it for you tonight. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It's through Jesus that you receive salvation tonight. It's through Jesus tonight that you have hope. He came for you to have eternal life in a relationship with God. And so what Jesus does is he mediates your relationship with God. He gets in between you and God. In 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's just one. I thank God that there's not a plethora of people I have to find and go to for help. That there's just one person and you know what? He's not always busy. When I call him, I don't get down to him. When I call him, he picks up. As a matter of fact, when I call him, he does better than pick up the phone. He shows up. And he says, I'm here because I've come to save you. That's what Jesus does. He shows up in your life in order that you might be saved. There's one mediator tonight. And he's here to take you off your ladder. He's here to talk you down tonight from, from all your striving and all your efforts and all your, the things that you're trying to do to impress God. He doesn't need that tonight. Jesus made the sacrifice for you. He died on a cross for you. He paid the price that you and I should have paid and could not pay. But he said, let me pay it for you. And so when he hung on a cross, 2,000 years ago, he thought of us. He thought of all of us sinners who needed the grace and mercy of God, who needed God to forgive us of our sins. You see, as a pastor, one of the questions people ask me is what makes Christianity right about everything else? What, what, what makes this different? Why should I believe? in Jesus over everybody else. And there's many reasons I can give, but I only want to give you one tonight. Just one. Every other religion in the world, and I've studied many, if not all, they all say, if you work hard enough, if you give enough money, if you do enough with your life, try to do enough good, then maybe, just maybe, God might pay some attention to if you're lucky, if you just happen to fall among one of the few who really, really, really catches God's eye, then God, he'll bless you. He'll forgive you. He'll accept you. Maybe one day you can, you can climb all the way to the top of the ladder and reach God. But what Christianity tells us, what Jesus tells us, is don't even get on the ladder. He says, don't even, don't even try. Don't, don't, don't try to impress me with, with all your goodness. Because all about says all our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. 
Then I'm offering him just, just nothing really when I'm trying to give him my righteousness. But what Christianity says, what, what Jesus says is just come to me. All who are troubled, all who are weary and heavy laden, he says, and I will give you rest. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, don't show me your effort. Don't show me how good you can be. Just come to me and surrender and give me your life and watch me transform it. It's not up to you to change your life. It's up to Jesus. See, Jesus has been sitting at the top of the ladder saying, work harder for me, work harder for me, give me more, do more, and eventually you'll get to me somewhere down the road, maybe 15 years. Instead, he waits at the bottom. Because the work is already done. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, some of the words he said, one of them was a phrase that's absolutely phenomenal. He says, it is finished. And what that meant was that everything you needed for salvation was completed in that moment. So you don't need to try and make it right with God tonight. Jesus already made it right for you. You just need to receive the finished work of the cross. Because that's what our Jesus does. He does it for us. Let me tell you, if you ever grew up hearing the foolishness that, that we hear all over the place, that God helps those who help themselves, that ain't my God. That's not my Bible. Because my Bible says that God saves those who cannot save themselves. And that's me and you. That's us tonight. And so let me tell you what you need to do here tonight. Pack up your ladder and give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus tonight. Give Ruben a round of applause for me. Thank you, Ruben. So tonight, pack your ladder up. You don't need it anymore. I'll tell you the title of my message now that I'm finished. Don't climb the ladder. Don't climb the ladder. Because Jesus is trying to get you to climb it tonight. Would you stand with me all over the room? Your passions. To surrender your concerns, to surrender your fears. Can I, can I tell you something? That all you need is a step of faith. That's it. A step. Not 15, not 25. You don't need five gallon buckets of faith tonight. You just need one step. And that step that we give to Jesus tonight. That we surrender to him and we say to him, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my passions. I'm giving you my work. I'm giving you my hustle. I'm giving you everything about who I am. I surrender all to you tonight, Jesus. As you surrender your crying to him, you let him save you. You let him have your life. You let him take control. You let him clean you up. Because you see, my biggest thing was God. I keep falling. And he said, that's all right, son. Get up. And I would go a little bit down the road and, and I'd fall again. And he said, that's all right, son. Get up. And I said, but God, are you sick of picking me up yet? Because I'm sick of falling. And he said, no, my son. I've already paid the price for this. I already died for this. So come on, get on up and keep walking in the grace of salvation that I've already given to you. It's already yours tonight. The price has already been paid. And so in a moment here, we're going to do a prayer of salvation. 
In a moment here, we're going we're gonna to give you the opportunity, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior tonight, for you to give your life to Him in full surrender, to pack up your ladder and hand it to Him and say, Jesus, I'm yours. Every one of those hands that you see up tonight represents a counselor. They're going to be coming to you in just a second. And, 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 but before they come to you, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you an opportunity to, counselors, you can put your hands down. We're going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand tonight and surrender to Jesus here in this place right now. I'm going to count to three tonight, and as I count to three, when we get to three, I, I want us to all raise our hands who are giving our life to Jesus. I'm going to raise my hand with you tonight. So if you're surrendering your life to Him, on the count of three, one, I just want you to know tonight that Jesus loves you. Two, I want you to be reminded tonight that He has already paid the price for your forgiveness, the full cost of it. So, as we raise our hands, we're going to surrender Him. Who are raising those hands tonight and we're going to surrender to Jesus? Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. I see that now. Anybody else tonight? Come on, raise those hands all across the room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I see both hands. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Anybody else tonight? Give your life to Him. If you raise your hand, keep your hand up. Don't put your hand down there. The counselors are going to come around in just a second, but before they begin to talk to you, we're going to pray a prayer of salvation to the other here. Keep your hand up if the counselor hasn't reached to you yet. Give a moment for everybody to, to get that opportunity. Raise your hand if that's you. This is the time. There's still a moment. Don't hesitate. I just sense right now that somebody that needs to have their hands up, that hasn't raised their hand yet, stop hesitating. Jesus didn't hesitate on the cross for you tonight. He loves you. He's here for you tonight. Raise that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. 